second. Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome from Berlin, Germany. It's another big pleasure having you with us today. It's another Alan Kruing Enigma expert talk. And uh, today, let's plan Dutch. We have Wolfgang Wirt from Transavia Holland, who is talking about advanced crew planning. And um, so the usual modus operandi is that people can ask questions during the session. Is this also okay for you or you want to keep them at the end? Because if it's during the session, I would help you, of course, to call in all the attendees if they have raised their hand. Uh, no, let's make it an interactive session. It would be nice. Perfect. So everybody, please don't be shy. Just raise your hand with the feature here in MS Teams and then I will call you in and then you can shoot all your questions to our lovely Dutch. Stage is yours, Wolfert. Yeah. Let me see where I got the presentation. There's no live sharing. Okay, I'll just share a window. Let's get into presentation mode. Works, we can see it. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> yeah, now I, I can't see you, so uh, please, uh, Daniel, uh, help if uh, if somebody raised uh, uh, a hand. I will do the next. Um, yeah, yeah, great. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, as I just explained, uh, normally I'm in the office, uh, but uh, on Tuesday I'm home looking for uh, after my daughter. Uh, that's why uh, the, the blurry or the pictured background um but that's uh, that's okay uh, about a half a half year ago uh, daniel asked me to uh, uh, do an enigma talk uh, any subject he said well um so the, obviously i was uh, really honored to do a presentation and uh yeah then i started thinking about well what shall we do uh, uh what is the subject what uh, uh, what do we want to talk about so uh, then I thought, well, maybe it's good uh, to uh, to share my uh, my journey uh, I had uh, within Transavia and the crew planning department um, uh, about crew planning, but also the evolution of crew planning. Uh, I was involved uh, during my time uh, at, uh, uh, at the Transavia crew planning. Uh, uh, as Daniel uh, already said, uh, let's make it an interactive uh, session. So please raise a hand, uh, or if I didn't uh, go too uh, into deep uh, into a subject and you would like to know know more about it, just raise your hand and and uh, and ask. Um, then, first of all, uh, Wolfert. Who is Wolfert? That's a that's a good uh, question, and I think uh, it's a uh, um, it's always good to use pictures because pictures says uh, more than a thousand words in general. Um, maybe I overdid it, but uh, uh, forgive me about that. Um, on the right, you see uh, some uh, some uh, personal pictures. Um, uh, the one in top is. Uh, uh, me and my wife did a hike in uh, Iceland a couple of years ago during the uh, the pandemic, uh, and this is uh, yeah this is something we really like to do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the the second picture, uh, the, the smaller picture, is uh, us uh, with our daughter uh, nine uh, nine months old. Uh, tomorrow she's nine months old, uh, and we are already sharing the love for hiking. Uh, uh, with her, uh, and then the the third picture is uh, uh, us in the plane. Um, when I was uh, 16, I started flying gliders, uh, and nowadays uh, I, I think about uh, I uh, I logged about 2,000 hours in the glider, um, and uh, uh, also I do uh, 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 teaching instructor uh, duties uh, at my uh, club. I really like uh, uh, people uh, teaching how to, gli uh, to fly gliders. It's a really passion of mine. But then, uh, well, we're not here to talk about Wolfert, uh, but to talk about Transavia and crew planning. Uh, so on the left, uh, you see me, uh, well, my LinkedIn uh, profile. Uh, actually, on the 1st of uh, October, I had a, um, 
a celebration of my 25 years in service within Transavia. Um, and it started after my study of aviation engineering at the University of Amsterdam. I joined Transavia at the flight operations department. Uh, and after that, I moved to the scheduling department where we create, uh, um, uh, we do all the flight planning and we create uh, the flight schedule of uh, Transavia. And uh, I think half of the 25 years uh, in service at Transavia is, um, is within the crew planning uh, domain. Um, in uh, several different positions, but currently I'm the uh, lead or the expert lead uh, for the cabin crew planning department. Um, uh, it says the lead, but I think I need to update my, uh, my profile uh, on LinkedIn. So that's something about me. Uh, then uh, Transavia. Uh, Transavia is uh, like uh, a reasonably old uh, company. Uh, in three days uh, from now, on the 17th of November, uh, we celebrate the uh, 57th birthday uh, of Transavia. Um, it started all on uh, in 1966 uh, 66, uh, with the first flight from Amsterdam to Naples and back with uh, DC-6, you see in the top picture. Um, it was a, an, a flight for a dance or a ballet group uh, who performed in Naples and we flew them back and forth out of Amsterdam. So that's how it all started uh, 75, uh, 57 uh, years ago. Um, after that, it was mainly uh, a, a charter company. Uh, but also we did some uh, uh, some years uh, uh, where we did cargo flights. Uh, after DC-6, we moved to the Caravelle and uh, I think somewhere in the 70s, uh, we moved to an all uh, Boeing fleet uh, uh, 737 with the exception of uh, four uh, 757s uh, somewhere around the turn of the millennium. We operated uh, four 757 aircraft, uh, but after that it's, it's uh, uh, mainly uh, or only 737. So never ever any Fokker aircraft, which is a Dutch manufacturer? No, no. Oh. I think we did some uh, some uh, leases like uh, summer summer leases for uh, Fokker aircraft uh, and all all kinds of uh, exotic aircraft like the BA 146 uh, has been in service, but it's not operated by Transavia, but also but always a lease in. Yeah. And uh, well, currently we operate uh, 45 uh, 737 uh, aircraft uh, um, out of, uh, we call it three and a half base. We actually have three bases in the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Eindhoven. And, uh, but we also started the base uh, in uh, Brussels, uh, but that's only an aircraft base and not yet a crew base. Uh, and well, uh, we only operate two aircraft out of Brussels, so nowadays we only do that uh, using complex pairings, but uh, um, uh, well, that's something for the future, probably future growth into that. Um, we employ approximately uh, 750 uh, uh, pilots and uh, around 1,400 cabin crew, and our flights are mainly uh, to Europe and the Mediterranean, and outside that, we fly to Dubai. Um, uh, we are an independent company, but within the uh, KLM uh, group, it's a KLM subsidiary and 100% owned by the KLM. Uh, uh, by the KLM, um, but we operate ourselves. It's not like City Hopper uh, that uh, that has a feeding function, but we we, uh, we are an own uh, company. And, and the typical uh, daily rotation of an aircraft is six to seven, eight legs, or? Uh, no, uh, I'll show you later. Uh, the typical rotation, uh, it's like four or six legs, like uh, two up and down or three up and down. Um, that's a good question. Uh, in the winter time, we do like extremely short flights uh, into uh, Innsbruck uh, uh, for the uh, for the winter, uh, and then sometimes we have uh, an, an extra rotation uh, in that. And uh, uh, also uh, sometimes mistaken, we also have a Transavia France. 
Uh, that's not Hotel Victor, but Techno Oscar. Uh, they operate uh, out of France uh, with their uh, their main office, their headquarters out of uh, Orly. Uh, and I think it was more or less 15 years ago they started operation. Uh, and uh, currently they are bigger than Transavia in Holland. Uh, Transavia France is owned for 40% by, uh, by Transavia Holland and 60% by Air France. So that's a big, uh, uh, already a big company and growing fast. And in the middle picture, you see, uh, well, one of the latest pictures of Transavia. Uh, we expect, well, I think in about uh, three weeks, uh, we expect the first uh, Airbus A321 uh, to be delivered uh, to our company. Uh, and before the end of the, the the year, of the end of this year, we will operate, uh, uh, start operating the Airbus. And that's a replacement uh, trajectory for the next uh, seven or eight years uh, to replace all Boeings by, uh, by uh, Airbus. So that's one of the main uh, topics nowadays in the crew planning is uh, changing from uh, all Boeing to all uh, Airbus uh, with a transition period of seven to eight years. Well, we're not talking about me or Transavia here. We're talking about crew planning. Uh, so uh, let's start my journey at uh, crew planning. When I started uh, approximately 12 years uh, ago at, uh, at the crew planning uh, department, uh, I hope you can see it uh, on the screen, but this is a, a pairing uh, print uh, out of our crew management system. And what you see is that typically a pairing consists of only uh, up and down flights, so two sectors in one uh, pairing, or maybe three sectors if there's a, a triangle of flight uh, where we uh, do uh, two destinations in one flight. But uh, the majority of, of our flights are just up and down and then a rest, and then uh, it's the end of the pairing. Um, uh, except for some uh, specific flights, uh, like uh, flights that do not end at, uh, at the same home base they started. Um, and that uh, uh, that's because uh, the opening times of uh, Amsterdam, uh, we operate at Amsterdam around the clock, but uh, in uh, Eindhoven and Rotterdam, there's a night curfew. So that's why uh, some pairings start uh, early morning in Amsterdam and uh, in the middle of the day, they end up in, uh, in Rotterdam or Eindhoven. Uh, and then we create a multi-day pairing where the next day they will do another flight or uh, with a taxi to another uh, destination and do another flight in there back home. So we do some multi-day pairings, uh, but not a lot. And as you already mentioned, uh, Daniel, it's uh, the the multi uh, or the more intense uh, flying is in the during the winter season when we fly to the, uh, all the winter destinations like Innsbruck, uh, Salzburg, uh, at the Alps. It's a short stage length, and then we do uh, in one pairing uh, for uh, four sector flights. Um, well, due to limitations, uh, prevent us from uh, connecting more flights uh, into one pairing. Uh, um, but that's something to look in uh, when we talk about pairing optimization. Um, if there are no questions, I just keep on talking. Um, this is a printout of our uh, uh, what a typically uh, uh, crew schedule looks like, and what you see is that uh, all uh, 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 the crew schedules are constructed out of the single day pairings. And uh, uh, when I started at uh, the crew planning department uh, around uh, 2011. Uh, all the schedules for the uh, 1,400 cabin crew members and 700 uh, cockpit crew members were, to, were created uh, manually. Uh, yeah. Crew could do a request, uh, sending an email to the planning department. Uh, please send me on that layover. Please send me uh, or uh, have me on a, on a day off uh, at that specific date. Uh, and we published every Friday, uh, we published another week for cockpit uh, and every other Friday we published two weeks for cabin departments. So that was what the rhythm within our uh, crew planning uh, uh, process. 
um, and uh, the uh, the crew planners did all the uh, they created the entire rostering. Uh, so not only the flight duties, but also the standby duties, training duties, uh, retraining, uh, union duties, illness, uh, uh, whatever uh, in the uh, needs to be done in the unpublished period. So you have like a general crew schedulers who know everything about everything. But this is interesting. Um, sometimes uh, talking with airlines, there is the complaint from crew members that with this, let's say, weekly or bi-weekly uh, publication, they don't know where they are next month. And for them, it's then difficult yep. to somehow plan. Was there not somehow the request from the crew members to have a bi-weekly or monthly yep. uh, Rosca publication? Or was there yep. a specific logic behind to have this weekly? No, that's what that that's was uh, because th that's like manageable uh, creating uh, manual rosters, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, because uh, this is when I started at group planning, and since then a lot has been changed. So good question. Uh, one thing to add is that after publication we have something uh, uh, like a day off request. We call it a snipperdag. Uh, typical Dutch word, uh, but that's uh, after publication. If you think, well, tomorrow is a good day for glider flying, then uh, you can request a snipper dag, and then uh, we we added some additional standbys uh, to accom accommodate uh, crew members to be an additional day off, even if it's after publication. Uh, then something about uh, how the uh, the planning department uh, what it looked like. Uh, I started as the manager of crew scheduling and training within uh, crew planning uh, 12 years ago. Uh, like we had the midterm planning creating um, uh, all the pairings uh, and and uh, people involved in the midterm planning were the connection between the long term capacity planning and the actual schedule creation. Then we had like, uh, I think, 15 crew uh, schedulers for both cockpit and cabin uh, crew. Uh, creating manually uh, uh, crew schedules out of uh, all the flight pairings, standby pairings, training assignments, uh, and other uh, all other duties, and also assigning the days off. Uh, and also the crew facilities uh, was in scope of the department, so all the bookings for hotel accommodation, uh, uh, flights, positioning, taxi, uh, and so on. Um, after publication, uh, uh, we called it the tracking control phase. Tracking is the phase uh, only roster maintenance and control is the day of operation. Um, and uh, uh, as a uh, support uh, department, we had uh, long term planning, like two long term planners, one for cockpit, one for cabin, uh, who did a capacity planning. Uh, and they determined uh, uh, in which weeks a certain trainings or a certain days off how much days off uh, could be granted. Uh, but that's more the like capacity planning. And then uh, in my department, it, the, the planning on the personal level started. Um, going to the process. Uh, um, this is what the primary process looks like, pairing, rostering and assignments, tracking and control. Uh, then we have the support uh, process of manpower planning. Uh, crew facilities and uh, business improvement and analysis. Uh, and for steering, uh, you have the crew planning management. So this is what the main uh, uh, processes of the crew planning department look like. And um, well, uh, how uh, uh, how it started is that uh, uh, a request from the union, uh, the cockpit union obviously, was to uh, have uh, uh, better rosters, obviously, they always want better rosters. Uh, and they said, well, KLM is using uh, a roster optimizer. Uh, Transavia should use one as well. Uh, normally, uh, when you change to optimizers, it's, um, it's uh, uh, in, in general uh, the idea that you start with a pairing optimizer. Uh, but because we had only the single day pairings, uh, we could skip the pairing optimizer and go straight for the roster optimizer. Um, and uh, I think in the 
2013 and on, we started uh, investigating, investigating the possibilities for uh, introducing uh, roster optimizer. Um, uh, first for cockpit, after that for uh, cabin, uh, after that we changed to uh, a pairing optimizer. Uh, and now we have some uh, like the tracking control as a little dotted line, so it's not an optimized process, but we are looking into possibilities of creating uh, something like automated uh, recovery, uh, well, optimization scripting or whatever. Uh, what we already do is support with a lot of data. Like uh, we have um, a modeling of uh, standby usage and so on. What what is a better roster? That would be my first question to the union. So you want to have a better roster? Yeah. Tell me what makes a better roster. Yeah, uh, that's uh, well. We had uh, four drivers. Uh, uh, why we wanted to introduce a uh, roster optimizer? Uh, the first thing, obviously, is personal preference. The process of sending an email to a crew scheduler, uh, well, that's not manageable with uh, with uh, like 2,000 crew members. Uh, so, uh, and also, it's it's not an efficient way of scheduling uh, based on preference. So, what we uh, the, uh, personal preference was one one of the main drivers. Then also, uh, people, uh, well, what typically happens if you create a manual roster is that the crew members with the uh, the most re who are the most restricted, like instructors or part-time uh, crew members, uh, they are uh, scheduled uh, first, and then afterwards you you get the the least uh, restricted crew members, like the full-time crew members, and then they end up with a more empty uh, schedule or a more a spatial schedule uh, and then the complaint was well we're all getting paid the same uh, so we want to have like a mechanism like fair share uh, but also uh, looking into the future uh, uh, seeing potential growth uh, and uh, within or without the Netherlands um, um, and we thought, well, if you if you introduce source optimizers, you you have a scalable process. For an optimizer, it's it's not relevant if it's several hundred or seven thousand crew members. It only takes runtime. Um, but that's that's one of the main drivers. And obviously, uh, efficiency was the driver for the company. You can so here's a nice here's a nice comment from Brian who says better roster is usually less flight time. Um, hours on average and more weekends and days off. But of yeah. course, what you are here showing on the slide is exactly pot potentially the perspective of the airline. So was yeah. there an agreement between the pilot union? What are the KPIs we want to jointly achieve or how you are somehow yeah. tackled to have a better roster from, from both sides? Uh, yeah, it was a combined effort uh, together with the union because uh, once you start uh, going from a manual roster into uh, uh, optimized uh, roster process, uh, it's like uh, going to the moon. Uh, it's like uh, uh, on forehand thinking, what would it be like if we were on the moon? And then what happens if something uh, well should be fixed or uh, you have no idea uh, how an, uh, an, an optimized uh, uh, process, uh, what it looks like. Thanks. Um, uh, so th that's why we combined uh, efforts and uh, we sit down with the union and, and uh, together we created a new world and uh, export the new possibilities. Um, what we already created was uh, 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 like a roster. Um, a basic uh, concept of the roster is that for cockpit it should be uh, a five week period, so 35 days, uh, uh, in which uh, 20 days are working days and 15 days are days off. Uh, that's a basic concept of a, a full time uh, a pilot schedule. Um, and then you have some limitations on uh, on the minimum length of uh, of a, a period of days off. Uh, and the maximum length of an uh, of a working week. So that that more or less is the basic concept. So that's that was already agreed uh, on. And when when you started to implement the roster optimizer and to apply them, you had already 45 aircraft, or you had less aircraft? 
and less pilots. I think uh, it was <coughs> like uh, eight years ago. I think we had uh, 38 aircraft and probably a little bit less uh, pilots, like seven, uh, 650, uh, something like that. And now, since you're using it, have you achieved um, your efficiency target to have more work with less equal crew? So had you, you have now more aircraft, more pilots, but not one-on-one? -on -one yeah, I think in general, we, we, uh, we use uh, less crew, uh, but also uh, we also learned uh, how to be better in uh, planning on efficient crew uh, capacity. So the crew factor <clears throat> has improved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also the scalability. Uh, I, I must uh, agree that uh, also because uh, scheduling pilots is a little bit more complicated than uh, cabin crew. Uh, so the scalability for cabin crew is uh, um, um, is, is is okay. And for cabin uh, planning, it doesn't matter if the uh, if the crew population uh, uh, expands or, or, or doubles. For cockpit, because we have all uh, kind of restrictions on uh, instructor duties, uh, airport qualifications, and so on. Uh, and nowadays, we also get the Airbus. It's a little bit complicated. So uh, the scalability is not fully achieved, uh, even though it's already the longest uh, process we have in place. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a, a struggle, I must say. Uh, and I think we uh, also improved on uh, on fairness. We, basically, we uh, we do uh, fairness on uh, on only a couple of uh, elements, like uh, 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 obviously duty hours, but also standby duties uh, and the total number of duties in the roster period. Uh, and what we also introduced after that is um, uh, a mechanism that looks back the last period. Were you on par, were you, uh, or were you above or below target? So you get a correction for the next period. So on average, we we see that uh, things equal out over over the, the the longer periods you plan. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, this was uh, was uh, introducing rostering for uh, for uh, cockpit. Uh, later on, we uh, did uh, for cabin. It was a separate project. Um, and also good to uh, to to mention is that um, we had uh, like a big project with the cabin unions um, uh, to see if we could change the total work and rest time regulations uh, into a new concept, uh, mainly using uh, a ROS optimizer. Um, and uh, but it still it was uh, like a, a little bit a bridge too far. Uh, because uh, I think the project overall was a success. Uh, uh, the majority of crew members voted uh, um, uh, pro the, the new uh, work and rest time regulations, on, but on the last minute, uh, uh, the unions uh, well bailed out and uh, we had to implement the current work and rest time regulations. So that was a, a, a big, uh, well, a disappointment, uh, I think, for all the, the project team members. But uh, yeah, uh, at some point you have to move on. And, and uh, uh, what we wanted is that we have a similar uh, uh, scheduling process for both cockpit and cabin. So that's why we uh, introduced the roster optimizers for uh, also for uh, for cabin. Uh, but uh, yeah, unfortunately not with a new CLA. And are you are you using also the optimizer in order to simulate a new contractual rule uh, during the yeah. union negotiation? Yeah. Yeah, that's the next slide. Um, you're you're ahead, uh, Daniel. <laughs> um, uh, because that's what we did uh, using a pairing optimizer. Uh, after we introduced both uh, uh, ROS optimizers for corporate and cabin, uh, we did an investigation uh, for uh, uh, for a pairing optimizer because we mainly use single day pairings. We thought, well, maybe it's it's good to do an, uh, a case study uh, together with Jefferson uh, about uh, uh, if we can increase productivity. And that was, well, that's the right picture. Uh, crew productivity was uh, the main driver, especially for cockpit. 
Um, and what we did is a case study if we can introduce multi-day pairings uh, using stopovers or sometimes uh, uh, positioning flight or a taxi ride, uh, but uh, squeezing out more uh, hours in one duty day. Uh, and that was the business case for introducing the pairing optimizer. Um, but also the benefits of a pairing optimizer are uh, obviously uh, uh, doing a workforce calculation, so a net crew calculation, how much crew do we need? Uh, and uh, referring to your question, Daniel, uh, that's where we uh, where we go in. If we want to change uh, a union uh, rule uh, in the work and rest time regulations, we uh, try to build it as, as fast as possible and try to do some simulation runs, seeing how much uh, crew productivity drops or gain uh, is uh, is created. And um, for um, uh, cabin, uh, we introduced a pairing optimizer uh, quite recent, uh, like uh, I think, uh, well, maybe three quarters of a year ago. Uh, not only for workforce calculation, but also for uh, mainly for creating a crew balance. Um, because as I said, we have three bases, Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Eindhoven, but it's one crew population. So uh, if we have a, a, like a, a holiday planning, uh, yeah, the holidays in Holland are spread out over the, uh, um, uh, the portions of the, uh, of the country. So if uh, a majority of crew members in Eindhoven uh, uh, are on holiday, uh, then we need to fill them in uh, with uh, Amsterdam crew members. So that's why we, uh, well, we are learning to use the pairing optimizer uh, for solving that uh, crew imbalance uh, over the basis. There's a nice question from Brian from Dublin. Brian, do you want yeah. to ask a question verbally, please? Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious um, about your optimizing software. Is it native or external to your roster management software? And if it is external, what, what were the biggest challenges you experienced in, in um, integrating or implementing it? Um, it's, uh, we both used the uh, pairing and the roster optimizer from Jefferson. So it's a JCP and JCR product. Um, and the Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the big advantage is that uh, the, um, um, I think that's uh, two slides down, this one. Um, what we changed is that uh, once we were, uh, went live with the ROS optimizer, we also created, uh, uh, we, well, we embraced Agile uh, working with uh, uh, Scrum, Scrum team. Uh, and um, the uh, optimizers of Jepson use a, a language called Rave. Um, and um, we team up with the KLM. KLM has, uh, um, I think, uh, something like eight uh, Rave development uh, like specialists. Um, and they, um, um, well, we team up with KLM to, uh, uh, well, create new code for new uh, new rules. And that uh, can be done both in the pairing and the uh, ROS optimizer. I, I think I'm going to be writing to you after this session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but maybe you, can, maybe you can give some, some information of how quickly can this be implemented? What are the typical challenges? I think this is also what Brian wants to know. Um, yeah. So if tomorrow somebody wants to implement a pairing or roster optimizer, what is maybe the length of a typical project? Of course, you would. Oh, uh, of, the, of, the, yeah. of the whole project of the pairing yeah. optimizer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that that was, uh, could be done quite fast, uh, introducing a, a pairing optimizer. Um, but uh, the main uh, challenge is always uh, integration. So how to how to uh, exchange information between uh, your optimizer and your crew management system, or the other way around? So that's uh, that's mainly the bottleneck. But I think uh, setting up a pairing optimizer, I think we did it like uh, half a year, something like that, maybe faster. But you also need to test all the rules and all the exceptions and and the behavior, and the, the, you need to tune and tweak uh, the uh, the pairing optimizer. 
to get it working well as expected. What what typically happens is you uh, when you introduce a, a pairing optimizer, it finds loopholes, uh, like loopholes uh, that are uh, probably legally uh, well, they are legal. Uh, but there are things like uh, you don't want to do. Uh, what we typically had is that um, if you do a flight up and down, uh, say in the afternoon, so you start at six in the afternoon, you return home at two at night. Uh, then what the pairing optimizer found is uh, if you uh, put it on waiting for like uh, four hours from two to six, then uh, the, the crew member can get a positioning flight to an outstation where uh, the next day he can pick up uh, uh, a new flight. Well, and that's a gain of productivity. That's a really low gain of productivity, but it costs obviously a an, uh, an, uh, positioning ticket. But that's that's calculated in the uh, in the optimized uh, result. But what you don't want is crew members to hang out uh, during the entire night in your in your crew center, uh, waiting for the first flight to uh, to depart to a, to an outstation. So that's what typically happens if you introduce a pairing optimizer. It finds the loopholes. Here we go. Is that a, was that a little bit of the answer uh, from Brian? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you have another question, just send me an email and then we'll have a look at it. Um, then, uh, as I said before, uh, this is what the uh, um, the planning period looks like. Uh, you said, well, uh, was it acceptable, uh, uh, Daniel, to do a weekly planning? Uh, what typically happens is that if you do roster optimization or pairing optimization, you need uh, uh, some sort sort of volume to do uh, optimization. So it's typically like three to five weeks or a month, something like that. Uh, so that was already agreed with the union to for the cockpit union to change to a roster period of five weeks. Uh, and what uh, what you see here, if uh, your roster period starts on day zero. Then uh, the uh, roster is published uh, through our uh, crew management system uh, two weeks ahead. Uh, then it takes uh, a little bit over two weeks to create these rosters, uh, in which time crew can bid for the specific pre preference. Uh, and what we do is in general, uh, like tune the optimizer to choose the right uh, way to create all the fairness and the uh, personal preference into a, a total set of rosters. Uh, and the final rosters are created in the last week and then they are published. Um, but before that, all things that are not planned by the optimizer, because the optimizer only plans the like the majority of uh, or, or of activities like flight standbys uh, and, and and so on, all the other stuff needs to be pre what we call pre-assigned, um, and that needs to be done on forehand. Uh, first, we started out with the uh, roster optimizer only optimizing uh, flights and standbys. So all training activities, all office duties, all uh, sickness, and all other things need to be pre-assigned uh, before you hand it over to the uh, uh, to the optimizer. Um, and nowadays on forehand, you need to run JCP creating your pairings um, um, because you need the pairings for the uh, flight training activities. So this this is typically what the, what the process uh, looks like. And it's like a continuous five weekly heart, heartbeat through the, uh, the uh, planning, uh, uh, planning department. And the optimizer is also optimizing the training of every individual pilot and cabin crew? Yeah, first, when we started off with using the optimizers, they did not. Uh, but that was a good thing when we introduced uh, the um, uh, uh, the pairing optimizers. We also uh, introduced the agile way of working using a scrum team that supported the planning department. Uh, with the uh, 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 yeah, well, the improvements of the uh, of the optimizers, and that's one of the main advantages uh, of the uh, of the optimizers that 
uh, we are encouraged to to uh, do the coding ourselves. Uh, as I said, we team up with the KLM uh, using their uh, programmers uh, to create improvements into your uh, optimization uh, process. And currently we are doing uh, the majority of all the flight training uh, is scheduled uh, uh, by the optimizer. And uh, that means that also the instructor can bid for specific days off or specific flights because uh, the optimizer chooses or a different instructor or see if the instructor duty matches the uh, uh, the requirements for the training. Um, but that's uh, 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 one of the uh, disadvantages is that uh, once you move away from manual uh, uh, rostering is that you need to think of everything on forehand. So you need to have a good refinement of how should the system behave when you uh, when you want to have uh, the training assigned. Uh, with all the exceptions uh, uh, people can uh, can think of. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, asked the uh, training automation, we uh, already did CLA negotiations are uh, things we already did with the uh, pairing, both pairing and the ROS optimizer to see uh, what the rosters look like. Uh, uh, last CLA negotiation for cabin, we introduced uh, uh, if you're above a certain age, uh, then a certain restrictions apply, so you don't have to do uh, extremely long night duties or uh, maybe a, a, a late checkout is only allowed once in your working week, something like that. And uh, these negotiations go hand in hand, creating the rules, see what the rosters look like, what do what uh, do the restrictions do with all the other rosters. Um, uh, so th uh, that's really useful to to do that uh, uh, that way of working using uh, using your systems supporting your CLA uh, negotiations. And how does uh, it work the uh, collaboration with ACMI operators? So you optimize your crews, they have their crews. Is there yeah. also an exchange of information, or everybody is doing his or her stuff and at the end you have to phone a lot and send a lot of emails yeah. how you are the last. keeping track <laughs> of the changes yeah the last uh, the acmi operators uh, we only use uh, well we try not to use them uh, but the last couple of summers we used uh, some acmi operators and then what we typically do is uh, uh, send them the flight program they create rosters for their crew uh, they send it back to us, uh, so we enter them into our planning system to check all the le uh, legal rules because then uh, all the rules for our operation are also applicable to the ACMI operator. So that's a, a lot of manual work. And um, have you also considered to somehow completely outsource crew planning because there are some players in the market who do this for airlines or is there the sense of losing control if somebody else is doing it uh, instead of Transavia stuff? Uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I've never considered it, uh, but yeah, I'm working at crew planning, so <laughs> I like to, <laughs> like to have my job. But no, but it's, I, I think it's a really good question. Uh, why do you do your crew planning yourself? That, that, that's an interesting idea. It's not necessarily that you need to do it uh, yourself as an airline. No, no, uh, but no, on the other hand, I'm, I'm you're completely blown away. For, I'm completely yeah. blown away. I have just talked with somebody from this part of the business, and usually we always hear oh, losing control and so on. And now you yeah. create a cognitive dissonance for me because you are so open about it. That's yeah. good. So maybe yeah. we should have we should have another panel and discuss yeah. the opportunities and the challenges in in this regard because I think. Um, might be an in interesting conversation amongst yeah. the experts. I think I think now we we are discussing it. I think uh, EU laws states that as an operator you are responsible for your crew planning and and also the the uh, the guarding of all the limitations. Uh, so in the end, even though you uh, third party uh, your your crew planning process. You are responsible for for the operation uh, or the monitor of your uh, operation. So, uh, but it's an in interesting idea. Yes, um, that's why we have the enigma to be very yeah, creative yeah, yeah, and yeah, discuss sure, new sure. ideas. <laughs> yeah. 
we're going a bit uh, back and forth into the presentation, but it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, uh, 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 did we uh, uh, encounter any problems or challenges? Yeah, obviously we do. Um, uh, especially uh, changing to the agile way of working. Uh, uh, that means that you you <coughs> need to have uh, what we call a minimum viable product. So the the initial product you take into service to uh, uh, creating your rosters needs to be quite good. So uh, uh, and normally an MVP states that it must do the basic things you need to do, but that's not good enough creating rosters for your for your crew members because you they expect quite a, a level of quality. Um, but it's also uh, well. We really learned how to uh, how backlog management is is done, because in the end, once you go live, you have like an enormous backlog of all items you want to add to your your system, or uh, maybe reporting or uh, improvements, enhancements. Uh, but you can only do the work. Uh, well, uh, uh, you can't unlimited. Uh, uh, the, the output is limited of your um, Scrum team. So that's really, uh, yeah. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, how backlog management is done, and especially uh, what typically happens is that somebody says, "Well, we had a new agreement with the union, and that needs to be implemented within one month." Because, yeah. You, we have our own uh, development team and uh, we are really capable of uh, uh, fast change. Uh, but then uh, all your backlog items, they they move, they change. And uh, uh, and that's typically uh, one of the things we are struggling still uh, on how to prioritize all the changes. Uh, um, and, and in the ideal situation, you do that on business value. Um, but sometimes if you have an agreement with the union uh, and otherwise you, uh, you are in court, if you're not uh, comply with the uh, new rules, uh, well, then uh, there's no uh, discussion worth about uh, prioritization. Uh, also, uh, in the ideal situation, if the amount of work exceeds the, uh, the capacity of the, of the team, you should scale up. Um, but then you're still an airline uh, running on a budget and uh, uh, and also where to get the good resources is also uh, uh, a question. So that's that's the, the daily struggle. And then uh, I think uh, I, I uh, point uh, um, I have two slides on specific things uh, that we did not. Well, we, we foresee them, but they are bigger than we uh, expected. And one thing is that uh, if you look on the left, you see all the schedule that are created. They were created manually. Uh, if you want to change a rule or if you want to change something last minute, you just call the crew scheduler and say, well, this crew member needs to have uh, their, uh, their schedule emptied. Uh, 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 fix it, even though it's only four hours before uh, your publication. The crew scheduler uh, uh, removes all the assignments uh, and see if 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 he or she can puzzle uh, all those assignments into all the other uh, schedules. Um, and uh, on the right, you see uh, the cascade of uh, of all the process steps creating the roster and. Uh, if you do roster optimization, uh, um, th that works really well if the, the the foundation on which you run uh, the optimization is like stable. So what you want is all the data on forehand, all data about sickness or maybe uh, flight changes that, that need to be done, like uh, commercial optimizations and so on. The, all things need to be done on forehand. Well, then if you think about back the two slides back on the on the enormous timeline uh, how far you should look into the future um, like here if you want to change something in your flight schedule for this period then sometimes you need to look like 60 70 80 days ahead and uh, there's no uh, well, if you think about booking flow, only in the in the last 50, 40, 30 days, the booking flow really predicts something about how successful the flight will be uh, in the revenue management uh, uh, point of view. So that's that's uh, one thing we really 
Well, we are really struggling with uh, the, the cascading of all your process steps, creating rosters from scratch. Uh, it takes up a lot of time. Um, and, uh, and also the technique of updating your data. Uh, well, it's, it's not that advanced yet. So we, uh, those are the things we are looking for uh, in the future to see if we can shorten the process and be more agile or uh, more flexible uh, um, or maybe better able to to uh, to receive changes uh, on a on a later notice i have one more question regarding uh, managing complexity and 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 change so you have a pairing and roster optimizer from vendor a and you have yeah. the cruise tracking system from vendor b so how are yeah. you making sure that if there's a rule change in the vendor A system that it's yeah. in sync with the rule engine of vendor B. Yeah, but that's also uh, in vendor A uh, in the pairing and the ROS optimizer. It's like a, a different systems. It's not like a single sort of uh, legality rules. So oh, OK. And obviously you can reuse a lot of coding. Uh, so it's faster uh, if it's from one vendor, but it needs to be done twice. So and you have then, in fact, three rule engines you have to keep in sync. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the, the biggest struggles. The, the big advantage is if it's from one vendor, then uh, like the um, the logic behind how rules are checked and, uh, and flagged and uh, how rules work is more or less the same. So if we have a change in the pairing and the ROS optimizer, then it's easier once you figure out how to do it, then it's easier to implement in both. But then you still need to go to the other vendor, uh, currently our CAE uh, CMS system. Um, uh, and that's that's different coding. And uh, most of the times we need uh, the vendor for that uh, to support us and uh, changing the, uh, the re legality coding. But that's that's uh, exactly one of the the major uh, uh, well challenges, so to say, uh, how to align all those changes in legality programming, but also business implementation. Uh, how do you inform all the users that on date X uh, there's a change in the rule uh, and the behavior of the system? Because earlier I asked whether you're using the optimizer for simulating the effect of a new rule. I know from yep. a large airline in, in Europe that they were also simulating the effect of a new commercial program, for example, because yep. we all know the industry is planning with 100% perfectionism and the reality yep. of, let's say, on-time performance is between 70 to 75%. So we have 25% to 30% waste. So yeah. are you also simulating a day of ops? If this rule is in place, the union is pushing hard for it. And now we are simulating some sickness from crew members. Uh, we have now some bad weather. We have this and this. What would this yeah. rule cause on our day of ops? Because on the perfect day, it might work, but maybe yeah. in the reality, it would then create a bottleneck for us. No, well, uh, not exactly simulation, uh, but uh, well, as probably a lot of airlines uh, already do, we have a lot of data uh, in our operational systems, both CMS, but also uh, flight operation systems. Uh, so we get better in extracting the correct uh, data or understanding the data better uh, to see where, where the weak points in your operation are. But no, uh, the, the, the short answer is no, we do not uh, simulate. But that's that's something well uh, we think about in the future. But there's only so much you can do at the time. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be ideal if you could uh, uh, simulate. Uh. Yeah, but I think this is the most important um, topic. We all hear about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Yeah. And then everybody is creating the perfect picture. And yeah. on the day of ops, suddenly, oh, oh, we didn't know, but yeah. <laughs> we know that the weather in December is maybe not yeah. like it is in July. Yeah, and uh, that's why I'm just, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And maybe that's uh, uh, well, uh, I had one more slide, or actually, 
uh, we only have time, I think, for one more slide. But that's actually uh, one of the uh, things I also want to mention. Um, it looks like uh, you have a self-driving car, but in the end, the, uh, that car also needs to be maintained. Uh, uh, as you say, machine learning and so on. Um, right now, uh, especially in the tracking control phase after publication, uh, it's like manual labor. Uh, people get in sick, people return from, from leave, uh, sick leave, uh, and all the schedules are changed manually. And those are things you typically want to have, like machine learning. Uh, and it's not so much that we need to get rid of all the uh, the tracking planners or the control planners, um, but uh, what you foresee is that there's a change in uh, in expertise you require for uh, future changes. Is that um, in the past days, uh, what you said, you just send in an email and say, from now from now on, we do things differently, and then everybody knew. But in the new uh, way of working, if you have things automated, you need to have like knowledge on uh, how the process will change and how to create new rules or new solvers or uh, new intelligence on on uh, on solving your problems. So it looks like well, if you have the uh, if you have the self-driving car, you don't need the driver. But in the end, you need to have uh, probably a couple of engineers helping you uh, um, uh, with the behavior of the self-driving car and improving the self-driving car. I was not expecting from a Dutch that you try to push for self-driving Formula One car. I believe you like to have a driver <laughs> in this car. <laughs> yeah, you need to have a, a look into the future. There, one day, Max won't be the best anymore, and then we have a self-driving Formula One car. Jurati, you have a question. I believe I was not the first, but I can ask as well. So thank you very much for the presentation. In the very beginning of your presentation, you were mentioning that the goal was uh, basically to improve crew satisfaction. So did you measure it somehow? And what was the feedback after the automation actually happened? Yeah, good question. <laughs> well, in the end, um, um, uh, creating uh, rosters based on preferences, like a bidding system, is not so much uh, uh, well, a good driver for satisfaction because it's like uh, a lottery. That's uh, that's how crew feels. It's a lottery. Um, but but in the end, uh, people need to get used to a new system, uh, and once they get used to or uh, know how to request things they want. Uh, uh, satisfaction grew over time, uh, and the same happened with uh, pilots and cabin. Also, for cabin crew, we had uh, like some well, really tough times. Uh, but that's also if you uh, if you have a shortage on crew, like a uh, whole Europe had last year or the year before, uh, then yeah, roster creation is not so much based on the, on the personal preference, but is it must fit, and that's it. Uh, so that that was a really dissatisfier, and uh, well, this year we did a good job uh, on um, on adding some some additional crew uh, for the sake of the preference of our crew members. So the crew satisfaction uh, for cabin is quite high, and for for cockpit, uh, I think it it's also quite high based on the fact that it's it feels like a lottery. I think they are used to uh, the way of working with a bidding system now. Uh, and just thank you very much. And just to continue on the crew satisfaction, uh, did you receive some kind of negative feedback um, decrease? Let's say that, oh, our block hours are now equalized or I get the off this I request. Uh, what was the feedback overall? Did you feel they uh, yourself? Yeah, but uh, that's, I think that's uh, without saying also uh, before you have an uh, ROS optimizer, people are next to each other in the crew room and, and uh, looking at their logbook and comparing, but it, it depends on, on so many uh, factors of uh, the, the thing is that uh, yeah, we get complaints, uh, but uh, well, somehow you need to build the trust that you uh, the rosters are created uh, more or less uh, uh, leveling out all the differences. Uh, but but crew is not uh, are not all the same. Like the crew population uh, uh, on specific bases are different. The hours are different. 
it, it, it depends if you're an, um, uh, a purser or a, a junior cabin attendant. Uh, it, it, that's not, a, it, it, it's a different crew group you belong to. So rosters are, are different. So Brian, short answer is, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I had. I just wanted to say your last slide very much resonated with me. The idea of the planning team becoming the engineering squad for the self-driving car. Um, I think that's that's a powerful an analogy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And that's uh, that's like an actual struggle right now to get uh, the right persons with the right knowledge and a nice uh, right experience uh, in teams to to create new uh, ideas and to to move forward. Indeed. And that's, uh, yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a, an easy saying, well, uh, you get the budget to get the people, but once you get the budget, then you need to hire the the, uh, the right people. And it takes it, it takes a while to get people uh, going into the company and get used to the process and make them, uh, uh, well, really useful uh, for uh, improvements. Today I spoke with a, a former head of crew planning of a European airline and he told me that the turnaround in this crew planning department is two years. So a crew planner stays only two years, then is new staff there and the challenge was to have untrained people to then use the optimizers in place. So is, is this a similar situation, how you make sure that you are driving the Formula One racing car, not just in the first and second gear, that you can really go up to the sixth and seventh um, gear and have really full throttle uh, optimization power. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the <laughs> the main struggle we are facing is that 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 if you have new people, uh, if you give them the racing car, they they end up in the in the tires uh, uh, or drive around the track quite slow and. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the I think we, last week uh, I was in the Washington conference, uh, also talking to other people. That's one of the main struggles with with all airlines, uh, uh, getting getting the right people uh, and training them and keeping them, because getting people is one, but then training them and and uh, uh, well keeping them within the company is like really hard. But the good news is we have the right people here, the experts in the airline crewing enigma. I think this was a wonderful insight in how to plan Dutch uh, advanced crew planning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfert, for uh, following my desire to uh, give more secrets and hints um, how Transavia is tackling the challenges uh, in the crew planning field. Uh, thank you very much also to everybody who was in the session. Um, so we plan to have no airline crewing Enigma expert session in December because everybody will probably be very busy to create rosters uh, for the Christmas period and later. So the next talk will be probably uh, in January. And um, if you have a question or two, please get back to us, uh, contact us. If you have if you have a suggestion for a presenter, that would be also a good idea. And uh, yeah, if we are not seeing each other. Before the end of this year, I wish you a good end of 2023. I wish you all the best for 2024, especially peace, love, harmony, that all your rosters play out and uh, that we see each other soon again in the new year. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Very Thank, bye you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you very bye. much for the invitation and uh, the good questions. Thanks. Bye.